Watanabe, and uh, I was one of the founders of Dynamical Systems Research, which was Microsoft's first acquisition. And uh, I was also a senior software product manager with Digital Equipment Corporation in charge of the computer security components of the VMS operating system in the early 90s. Uh, but um, I'm actually really interested in, in this presentation because I began my career at Hughes Aircraft Company in the Space and Communications Group. Chris, go ahead. Hey, Wenging, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Chris, you are mute. Um, Chris, yes, do mute it. I can help you to unmute. How about now? Can you? Yeah, yes. there we go. Hi, I'm Christopher Walton, uh, an old MBA and an attorney at law, uh, also a former Santa Monica City Commissioner. Very glad to be here again this year. Thank you. Thank you. And me, my apologies for being late. I had a technical difficulty. My name is Intisar Durham. I'm your senior judge. Um, I'm an engineer uh, by career over 40 years. Uh, I do work, uh, I'm semi-retired, uh, still working in the engineering field, so on a part-time basis. I'd like to go over some ground rules uh, for the team uh, before we get started. So again, we have introduced ourselves. Um, when you start, you will be introducing your team as well. And, um, uh, and again, in this part of the competition, you're taking, just please remember, you're taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to us, uh, the judges. Please make sure everyone knows who you are and who they are before you begin. You will have 25 minutes. I'll keep time to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three fronts. During this time, uh, you will be uninterrupted, we promise. Uh, when you are finished, uh, we will have a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. Uh, that's formal, again, when we are still in our assumed and you are in your assumed roles. And uh, after the presentation Q&A, if you like, we, we would like to give you some much more personal feedback on how the presentation went. So with that said, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Pankaj. Good afternoon, everyone. Imagine waking up tomorrow to find out that your phone has no signal, your GPS is down, and your global communication are in chaos. This isn't a plot of a fictional science movie, but it can be a real possibility if we don't address the growing challenge of space debris pollution. On this note, I would like to introduce my organization and my team to you all. We are a group of five young consultants who have come together to form a boutique consulting firm named Space Avengers Consulting. And we have partnered with SpaceX uh, to pioneer strategies for mitigating space debris and ensuring the long-term sustainability of our orbital activities. Our approach encompasses the design of spacecraft and missions to minimize the debris creation, active debris removal technologies, and the promotion of international cooperation for debris tracking man and management. We are very delighted to be presenting today to the International Society of Environmental Sustainability and uh, present our proposal for active mitigation of space debris pollution. So as we speak today to discuss the critical challenge of space debris, nature is presenting us with a spectacular cosmic phenomena right outside our windows in our region, a solar eclipse. Uh, much like this eclipse, space debris cast a shadow over our planet's orbit. But unlike the brief darkness on the eclipse, which will soon pass, leaving the sun to shine brightly once again, the shadow cast by space debris could linger indefinitely, threatening the sustainability of our orbital environment. At Space Avengers Consulting, we are on a mission to ensure that this shadow is lifted. 
Can you move forward, Pankaj? Yeah. Space debris or space junk refers to defunct human-made objects in orbit around Earth. This includes everything from spent rockets um, and uh, old satellites to fragments from, from satellite collisions and disintegration. As of now, there are 23,000 pieces of debris larger than 10 centimeter being tracked, but it's estimated that there are hundreds of thousands of pieces smaller than this. Each are capable of damaging or destroying satellites and spacecraft. This is why the picture uh, on this slide is very interesting to me. We started 1957, the space exploration, and since then, the cast around the orbital, the Earth orbit is increasing and it's gonna increase forever if we don't take active steps to mitigate it. Uh, so the sources of the space debris can be from dates, dead spacecraft, lost equipment, anti-satellite weaponry, boosters, Next slide, please. The risk this poses cannot be overstated. Space debris threatens active satellites that provide critical services from weather forecasting and GPS to international communications and Earth observation. A significant collision could also danger human life, particularly astronauts abroad at the international space stations. Our team would be discussing further how we are uh, proposing our uh, uh, steps to go uh, mitigate this risk. I invite Nisha to take on over this. Thank you, Supriya. So we've uh, realized that uh, the space debris uh, is has a phenomenal impact even on the Earth. The after effects could in uh, after effect of it has phenomenal impact on Earth's agricultural domain as well. Some so some of the notable incidents on Earth we have found was from Falcon 9 rocket, wherein there was a breach in helium system due to which the uh, the, the spaceship has relaunched from, uh, relaunched from the space over Washington, producing a white light and air pollution. We also uh, found out that the Starship debris of the SpaceX uh, has explosive first launch, which had plumes of potentially hazardous debris over homes and habitats of endangered animals. The crew one aircraft had pieces of space junk crashed into a farmer's property, impacting his livelihood. Uh, I would also now uh, ask my colleague uh, Rohini to tell, uh, give lights on the impact on the space. Um, so the incidents are not only uh, in uh, on Earth, but also in space. So some of the incidents, as we can see, uh, are the Dragon spacecraft like 45 of which became defunctional due to the eruptions from the sun. And it is not only the spacecraft, but also the boosters, uh, which caused debris, uh, not only in the space, but uh, that re-entered onto the earth. And uh, we can also see that uh, SpaceX plans to build as many as 42,000 satellites as a mega constellation. And uh, assuming a 3% loss rate uh, in this situation, uh, would have a huge impact on the universal biodiversity. Next slide. Now I um, would hand over it to Pankaj. Uh, so when it comes to how disastrous the condition can be when it comes to the space debris that have been building around with time, I would help you characterize how the event looks from a low Earth orbit, from the medium Earth orbit and geosynchronous height. So the major traffic that we have been seeing has been in the low Earth orbit. And when we speak about the low Earth orbit, it's in the altitude range of around 500 to 7,000 kilometers. And the debris as Supriya previously mentioned was they could be relatively small in size, but what really bothers us is the velocity at, at which they move they could be moving at a velocity of around 22,000 miles per hour. So we can just imagine like if a small object in, in the size of a nail, if it hits someone on the earth or hits a house, it could be disastrous. And also like with the amount of uh, satellites and the base that has been building in the outer space, they, there could be a cascading effect. As in with the amount of debris that we have as of now, they are not much of a concern, I, I would say, given the number. But if we were to continue in the same way, wherein the debris just keep populating, 
So that would increase in a number in a way that could hamper the operational satellites and bringing them non-functional. So in a way, they just get cascading one on top of the other and thus leading to the effect we call Kessler syndrome. So when it comes to uh, dealing with the debris at higher altitudes, they are a little lesser significant as compared to the ones at the ones in the low Earth orbit, uh, low Earth orbits, because the traffic is very, very high in the low Earth orbits in the order of hundreds of thousands of uh, the objects that fly around there because the drag is pretty less when we go to the higher altitudes. So what we are majorly concerned about is the traffic and the debris around the low Earth orbits, and we should be addressing them on a short-term basis. And our recommendations that we'll be speaking of in due course and time in the couple of slides are aligned along the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And we are particularly emphasizing on two goals, that is goal 13, that was the climate action, with the booster rockets that are being fired out in this space, especially with the constellation that Starlink has been looking to build. It's not just the live satellites they're looking to launch, it's the boosters which are launched in the outer space just for testing purpose. Maybe it could be for a technology demonstration. So what happens when they go out in the outer space, it's most of the metals, it, it could be in the form of aluminum or they could be sending out carbons in the atmosphere. So when it comes to the climate shift, it's not less that we get to see in our normal lives to make, not consider the objectifying of the uh, space missions that we are into. And the second goal that we are looking to target in our recommendations is the partnership goals. So SpaceX is a fairly large institution and people in the space industry look up to the industry for their space programs. So they definitely should be leading by example. Coming to the recommendations, when it comes to the satellites, there is not much we can do when we once we set an object in the outer space because physically we have no contact with them except for the ones wherein they are manned, like this International Space Station, say a satellite which is in the outer space apart from them. They are on their own. We could just command them. If something goes wrong, we are not able to control it. So what happens if a satellite is not able to function, if there is a hardware failure? We should have something to be attended and to be able to dispose it on an emergency basis. Say a panel has failed and we are not able to support it when the satellite goes behind the earth. In that case, we should be able to decommission it immediately. So these are a couple of techniques that we could use to arrest the satellite velocity because if we leave the satellite in the low earth orbit and allow them to decompose in orbit and re-enter the earth, it could take them weeks, months, and years altogether. We don't want the dysfunctional satellites to be staying in the orbit. So these are the couple of techniques to slow down the velocity so they come back to the atmosphere and they burn out and they don't just stay in the space. It could be a harpoon, it could be a catapult, it could be a deployable sail, or we could use lasers to slow down the velocity. So further speaking along the lines of recommendations, active maneuverability is something that we are looking for. We don't wanna have a satellite which has kind of lost its uh, control and we want them to be controlled to an extent that we are able to bring it back to its burnout stage. We don't want them to be abandoned in the space. And definitely SpaceX should be looking for reusable and recyclable satellites because that in a way is not just reducing the space debris, but then again, being a leader in the industry, it will be fostering a culture of res responsible space operations. Given, as I have been saying, the traffic in this space has been immense. So we definitely wanna be monitoring that and we want to be responsible. So what happens if we have a number of satellites, we definitely wanna be informed about the traffic in the outer space. Other space agencies want to be informed about how the tra traffic, it, it may not be regarding the operations, but definitely not all the objects are cataloged but we know what our objects are in the outer space. So we de definitely want others to be facilitated in a way that they are informed about the traffic. So that is what we'd like to emphasize on. And also like if we had an autonomous operating system to inform other missions that would kind of facilitate them as I previously mentioned about how the orbit of the satellite is in a way that other agencies are able to reorient the, their satellites well, well in ad advance. So, and when it comes to the audit system, when we have a third party audit, I would say that that is more fair and we tend to be 
tight on what we are operating with and we definitely want to be sticking around on ethical purposes so a third party audit would be something that we definitely and highly recommend and come building along the sustainable materials because as i previously mentioned a lot of objects in the form of metals and gases have been adding to the atmosphere and metals like aluminum could be depleting our ozone layer and that that has been the news for quite some time so we definitely want to be looking at materials which are sustainable in nature and being the leader in the industry as i have been emphasizing again and again we definitely want to be building along the lines so as to bring down the nature of uh, uh i mean the harmful emissions that we have been committing so far so speaking along the line japan is set to launch world's first wooden satellite i know it's going to be really expensive but it's more going to be like a technology demonstration to tell to the rest of the world that we are responsible and we are building along the sustainable focus so having discussed so having discussed the uh, technical aspects of space debris and our recommendations to spacex uh, it's also important to uh, understand that uh, this issue isn't just about technology but uh, it also has a significant legal implication next slide uh, uh so we can see that um, if we uh, uh, we have environmental uh, concerns and lawsuits uh, we have tribe in texas and environmental groups who are uh, asking to suspend spacex 5 uh, year license which was granted by the federal aviation uh, administration and uh, legal experts uh, also suggest that uh, people who have been uh, Uh, injured by uh, the debris can uh, can um, uh, sue the company and ask for uh, uh, compensation next slide uh, also uh, in the legal dimension uh, spacex is going through a scrutiny for a collision avoidance analysis uh, it was uh, faa has fined uh, 175000 to spacex because it uh, did not provide uh, it failed to provide the collision avoidance data uh, before the falcon 9 launch and also uh, the spacex uh, had to make uh, around 50000 uh, maneuver avoidance collisions and as of 2028 it is estimated that uh, uh, 1 million maneuvers uh, may, might take place and uh, Uh, SpaceX has to adhere to uh, policies, procedures, and rules formulated by the uh, listed governing bodies. Uh, if they are not compliant, it would lead to situations uh, from uh, hefty penalties uh, to revocation of the license. And uh, SpaceX can also face uh, uh, lawsuits if uh, collisions in the in the near future take place with other satellites, or they are responsible for creation of new debris. Uh, as uh, my colleague pankaj already spoke about the ozone layer uh, so when uh, we have reentry of satellites uh, onto the earth surface um, they release uh, chemicals such as aluminum which converted to aluminum oxide and there are companies like uh, schneider steel which have been uh, paying penalty for not uh, following the uh, regulatory compliance and uh, with spacex having around 42000 satellites in their mega constellation it is expected that at least 2.2 tons of uh, dead satellites uh, might enter earth's atmosphere daily um uh, the strategies uh, that we adopt uh, aren't just influenced by technology or the legal dimension but also uh, uh, our recommendation should be financially uh, viable Uh, so let's shift our focus to uh, the financial dimension um uh, so uh, as you can see that uh, uh, the company uh, has regulatory uh, compliance costs so uh, each of these factors uh, such as design measures surveillance and tracking and maneuvering satellites and replacing missions uh, all of them uh, contribute to the overall cost of the regulatory compliance and it is important to consider these when uh, planning for sustainable space operations uh, in the financial dimension uh, liability and insurance are key considerations uh, due to the significant uh, financial implications of uh, potential uh, collisions and accidents uh, involved 
uh, involving the space debris. Uh, and uh, we can also note that uh, operation, uh, operational delays and losses are significant uh, considering uh, space operations uh, as they can uh, impact timelines and uh, result in uh, financial implications. Uh, however, uh, of the all uh, three uh, listed above, uh, one which stands out the most is the uh, most crucial aspect uh, in SpaceX reputation uh, would be, uh, the most crucial aspect uh, would be SpaceX reputation and the market positioning uh, uh, with a staggering uh, valuation of uh, $180 billion. Uh, so I would like to transfer it to Nisha. Thank you, Rohini. Uh, if you could go to the Pankaj, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so we at Space at, uh, Space Avengers Consulting believe that uh, you know space belongs to all, uh, all of humanity, and should be used for the benefit of all. The creation of uh, space debris, as mentioned previously by my colleagues, can be seen as a violation of this principle, as it limits the ability of other factors to safely and effectively use space. The sustainability of space as a resource for future generation is compromised by such space debris. Space, SpaceX having first mover advantage in the domain of space, it's especially imperative to uh, preserve the integrity of space for those who come after us, setting up an example. Space de debris poses a significant risk to spacecraft, satellites, astronauts, and many other, potentially causing harm or loss of life. Ethically, we have a duty pr to prevent them where possible. Ha despite making profit, it is imperative for a company like SpaceX to a space to contribute to its ethical dimension and uh, satisfy other stakeholders if impacting directly or indirectly. Um, next, I would go to the implementation challenges and risk mitigation. So uh, basically, we have given a list of recommendation from uh, our consulting. However, we do have, uh, we do are aware of the implementation challenges, and we would also come up with uh, risk mitiga uh, risk mitigating strategies. First, being technological uh, implications, we understand that the technologies are complex in nature and is still in experimental stages. Feasibility through rapid tech advancements and continuous R and D for innovative solution would uh, aid the would aid such implications. Uh, we also are aware of the economic viability in terms of cost associated with tracking and removing debris are being, being high. Currently, there's a lack of clear economic incentives for companies to invest in such efforts. Finding ways such as uh, cost reduction through space commercialization, economic viability through business models and partnerships, potential returns from new industries such as space tourism would aid such viability. We also understand that coordination among various stakeholders, uh, including private, public, government, international organizations is pivotal for the uh, for reduction of space debris. So public awareness and support such as in media, enhancing the PR system, educating uh, educating the people being affected indirectly or directly is very much essential through educational incentives and high profile missions such as Mars rovers for exterior life is what we think is imperative. Um. As we wrap up our presentation, uh, we would like to leave you with a thought from our team at uh, Space Avengers Consulting. This quote uh, encapsulates our vision and the essence of our recommendations. So as we reach for the stars, let's ensure the path remains clear for all who follow. Together, we can secure a sustainable future in space. This is our commitment, like our two cents to SpaceX, uh, to the future of space exploration. Uh, we believe that uh, with the right strategies in place, uh, like addressing the technical, the legal, and the financial dimensions, we can uh, navigate through the challenges uh, of uh, space debris very effectively. And uh, thank you for your time and consideration. We look forward to working together to secure a sustainable future in space. And now the floor is open for questions and discussions. 
Thank you so very much for a great presentation. Uh, a lot of we have a lot of information to digest. But before we get started with the Q and A, I would like to introduce, uh, or for uh, for Miss um, Flynn to introduce herself. She's a judge. I wasn't aware she's going to be um, on our uh, session. Uh, but yeah, please please introduce yourself. Uh, let the team know. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry, it was a last minute ad. Uh, my name's Nock Flynn. I, uh, I'm a corporate controller at a sustainability construction firm. I previously worked in commercial space industry, so this is a very um, deeply passionate topic for me and looking forward to, well, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to start uh, actually with the questions with uh, some of the technical uh, issues that could be affecting implementation. So um, I had not heard uh, that Japan had just launched a wooden or will be soon launching a wooden uh, spacecraft. Uh, I, you know, uh, it's it's kind of it's very interesting. Uh, do you know if our team, our company, had looked at that? Uh, and um, and and where is that in the process? Using different material for for the spacecraft. Yes, so I would like to take this quick question. So when it comes to when we say it's building a wooden satellite, it's not gonna, going to be completely wooden because definitely that wouldn't be viable. But what we are trying to avoid here is the generic materials are centered around aluminium or the others which could be disastrous when they fall back uh, like into the atmosphere and when they burp, burn out. We definitely don't want to be harming our ozone layer as we pre previously mentioned. So the stage that they are in, so basically they, they are in the building phase and they'll not be launching this year that, that they have said they were projecting it to be launched around 2025. So it's an encapsulation of wood which will be definitely sealed along with the gold layer on top of it because a wood in a, it's, itself wouldn't survive for- Exactly. Gold. Yeah, exactly. So they'll be encapsulating it with a material followed by a gold encapsulation so as to get rid of the electrostatic charge and everything that happens to be in place. So okay. that would be it. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Lois, would you like to go next? Well, I was uh, curious, uh, since, since, since uh, wooden spacecraft got uh, brought up, uh, I was, I was interested, interested to know what other kinds of materials you might have investigated. Uh, as you know, uh, there have been uh, titanium used in spacecraft. Uh, so I was just wondering uh, what, you, what, you, what you did, uh, what, what other things you might have explored. Uh, I would like to speak on this a bit again. So when I see it's majorly the, the major part of the boosters that we have were centered around aluminum, aluminum alloys. And the first and the second stage, which happen to be launched, they typically don't cross the upper atmosphere. So they tend to uh, be in the atmosphere itself and they don't burn out essentially. So when it comes to the satellites that we speak of, they are majorly built with titanium parts, as I, I would say the outer body. And the, the part which is exposed the most is uh, foiled with the gold layer. So uh, that is what it is. And it's uh, majorly, uh, the satellite when I say it's uh, majorly titanium that it is composed of, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, unmuted. Good presentation, everybody. Fascinating stuff. I always wonder about that, especially after I saw that movie, uh, I think it was called Gravity, with the big uh, accident in space. Does, what, what ethical guidelines does SpaceX have now, you know, in their charter for what they're doing? Do they have a, a list of, uh, you know, ethical guidelines already? Anybody know? 
the ethical guidelines are SpaceX, uh, which we are recommending to follow is um, use uh, invest in R and D so they can come out with more ethical, uh, uh, more sustainable products. So it's for the greater good of the universal biodiversity. At the same time, to uh, also have regular audit checks because if you have a regular audit checks, that's when you know we could. We cannot completely avoid, but reduce the impact, and it is under check and then controls. Is there an international organization that coordinates space debris? Uh, there is not. There is not really a structured uh, organization. Uh, so, you know, to ha have a sustainable and ethically well versed company in the society, uh, we came up with. Uh, you know, a recommendation of having its audit trials and public having it their public relations in, and press releases. So the society is aware that there there is, you know, there could be space debris and how SpaceX is, you know, uh, re mitigating it. I would like to slightly add to that. So when it comes to the committee that you might be looking for, I feel there is IADC, DC which kind of looks into all this debris man management tools. They call it International Astronomical Debris Committee. So it's an international committee which kind of looks into the debris that we find in the outer space. OK, thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting. Um, how, how, I'm, I'm so sorry. I have to ask you how to say your first name. It's, it's Nock. Nock, everybody. <laughs> Yes, it's your not Lynn. <laughs> it's your turn. Yes, thank you so much. And first of all, thank you for the presentation. You all picked a very challenging topic, and but it's also a very important and hot topic in the space community right now. So uh, huge kudos for taking on the topic. I think my question is around the applicability of your recommendations across the board for different companies. With SpaceX is, they are responsible for the end-to-end -end launch development and operation of the satellite so the entire life cycle of the satellites in the case where you have companies that are different they're providing the different services you have a launch provider that is separate from the satellite maker to the operation in that case can you help me understand a little bit more on one, who should be bearing the cost, the added cost of your recommendation? And two, who should be legally responsible for implementing the recommendation? Is it the launch provider or is it the satellite maker or is it the operator who should be deorbiting the satellites? Uh, I'd like to take this up again. So what I personally feel is, and please point me out if I'm wrong. So what happens is we definitely have different entities. We have the launcher, we have the satellite, and we could have an operational sense center. So mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, it's not just the satellite in isolation, which is kind of causing debris in the outer space. It's the launcher as well, which tends to launch the south satellite. So in my opinion, I feel it's the launch company, which launches the satellite in the uh, outer space should be responsible for their part of the de debris which is to be managed and the major chunk of the load would go to the satellite company because they tend to operate for a period of anywhere between 5 to 15 years depending upon how long the life is so it's the major chunk of uh, what the uh, product of the entire operation is as in launching to setting the satellite in the outer space to controlling it. I feel it's the satellite entity which tends to take the major uh, benefit out of it. And it, that should be the one who should be taking the re responsibility because that is the one which tends to be for the ma major chunk of life. Thank you for the consideration on that. Uh, one, one, more, one more question for me. So uh, I know, I, I think, uh, Lois or or Christopher had asked for what is SpaceX mission statement, and it is to rebellionize uh, space technology with the ultimate goal of enabling people to live on other planets. I just want to remind you, um, as as our consultants, that SpaceX was the first company to use reusable rockets 
uh, before then it was a one-time use, as, as you can remember. Um, so I would like to, to uh, again, to see if we were to follow one of your recommendations, how would that, you know, what is the cost associated with it? Is it, is it an, a net cost? Is it a net profit? What, uh, what is that? Have you looked at that? Uh, I'm not sure if I got your question right, but uh, I would like to uh, like give my understanding of what I thought your question was. When it comes to the reusable launch vehicles, it definitely is more expensive than the normal ones that we see flying as against the reusable ones. So are we speaking about the cost of building the reusable big vehicles or is no, it? Uh, no, actually I, I was, my, my question was, we are a, a, a company at the cutting edge. We are doing the reusable rockets, which before then it wasn't something that was used, correct? Yes. So I just, um, so we, we always are looking to invent and to improve the technology. So if you could help us in making our decisions easier to let us know what new technologies that we could use, some of the recommendations you have, and, and what cost does it have associated with it? Have you looked at that, at the cost associated with some of these in initiatives? Well, frankly speaking, we don't have a financial perspective to what it would look like for this technological advancements, but definitely your reusable launch vehicle is something which is along the uh, sustainable development goals because we won't be burning that out in the outer space. It's com coming back to the earth and we are reusing it. I'm sorry about, uh, I'll not be able to comment on the financials. <laughs> No, no, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, no worries. Uh, thank you. I, I do hope that you would be looking into it for us as a next step and as our consultants, of course. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the judges? I, I do have a question. You know, uh, uh, as, as you can see, just from your present, the beginning of your presentation, you were talking about the consequences of having so much this exponential increase in in space debris and, and 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 what kinds of problems that would create but you know uh, everything is is not static either you know the from the legal perspective in particular you have a lot of different stakeholders involved in in uh, what happens and so uh, uh, have you take have you considered some of the aspects about the uh, the changes in uh, regulation uh, or uh, 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 that that may come up that 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 present uh, issues for uh, you know I mean because they probably involve cost. Uh, when it comes to. I'm sorry, I might uh, try to answer this uh, on the legal perspective, but I feel is definitely, first of all, not all the organizations have access to the uh, tools or uh, the debris management system that we have outside. So definitely when we put a legal system in place, it could be a couple of eyes have, having an actual look at what the system is in the outer space. So when it comes to legality issues, definitely, if we put more stringent uh, uh, legal perspective to it, there could be few, fewer parties participating into it or uh, legal obligations might uh, drive down a couple of parties. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm speaking along the lines to the question that you asked. Uh, well, I was just saying that uh, there, there seems to be a lot of things. I mean, the U.S. has its set of laws. Uh, uh, you have uh, things being pre presented from the United Nations uh, uh, perspective. Uh, 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 we, we, we do have countries that aren't necessarily uh, uh, as committed uh, to being good neighbors. So, uh, so, so uh, 
you know, uh, that that could result in um, some uh, 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 may, maybe a, a, a more severe conflict. So I'm just trying to I'm just trying to see uh, uh, whether or not you've anticipated some of those kinds of problems that could crop up uh, from a you know that represents a legal diplomatic kind of uh, thing. Yes. I I would like to partially add to whatever I just said, and I previously spoke about the IADC guidelines. So even though we might have separate countries launching their satellites or object in the outer space, but we definitely had have an international forum, which is to be approached before you launch a satellite or an object in the outer space. So it is a body which is looking into it, and there are implications if you don't abide by it. Say when a satellite is launched and you, you're supposed to decommission it, if you don't do it, there's a heavy penalty involved as against how much you would require to bring it back and burn it out in the atmosphere or put it into a graveyard orbit. So there's a body which is in place, which kind of mom, monitors uniformly across <coughs> all the organizations. So that would be my take on that. Okay. Any, any more questions? for the formal session before we give uh, the team some feedback? No? All right. Uh, well, uh, thank again. I would like to thank the team for uh, uh, you did uh, a very good presentation, uh, well researched. I think you covered uh, most of the areas very well. Um, uh, since uh, and, and you handled the questions well. And believe me, we were not asking you any trick questions or anything. We, we just like you, we want to know. Uh, so, um, and, and especially like, you know, the ideas that sometimes you go to a presentation and you don't have all of the answers yet. So it's always good to say, you know, we haven't looked at some of the details yet, but we will be coming back to you. So it's it's you know so so keep keep your your audience uh, engaged because again if uh, if you're being asked about something missing it's just uh, it's good to say well we are looking into it and once it's ready we'll be back to you general that's a general presentation rule any any other feedback from the judges on how the presentation went uh, they all spoke you know how's how is that? I'll, I'll hop in. I think it was a really good presentation. Mm -hmm. In the three or four years that I've been judging this thing, this is the most fascinating subject matter that I've ever heard about. And you guys seem to have pretty much mastered the subject matter with the exception of some of the financial implications of carrying out your, uh, your guidelines. Um, I, I think it was really good. I was impressed. Um, I liked it. That's it. Yeah. I have some uh, feedback so I can share. Um, first of all, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Um, can really tell that you have demonstrated the technical understanding of the different um, space knowledge. One recommendation is on the financial side. Um, as consultants, you definitely want to get a good grasp on the incremental cost of your suggestions, especially if you're talking to a stakeholder who is the satellite developer and you're recommending you should pay for the cost. So understanding, how, well, how much am I paying for this cost that's coming out of my profit? So looking at different strategies that perhaps might be a cost share, maybe there is a governmental aspect that you can look into R&D for your suggestions. So really honing in on that incremental cost of your suggestions. And then on the legal side, um, you're dealing with an issue that spans across so many different countries where politics is an a big issue to deal with and um, telling a country they need to do something is going to be challenging. So looking at it strategically from are there lobbying initiatives that the company should be considering in trying to carry out some of these suggestions that you have. 
that that can really provide some insights to maybe this is something that you can carry out and get support on from different countries or different political parties. Um, other than that, great job. Thank you for sharing the information you have. Okay, I, I guess uh, I guess I'll uh, I'll say that I really thought that the slides were really excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and I, I thought you did a really great job of, of uh, encapsulating the, uh, you know, what is a lot of information uh, uh, on the slides. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, thinking about models, okay, so I remember at Hughes Aircraft Company, you know, it used to be we would uh, build the satellite uh, and uh, and then launch it, and 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 we would cover all the costs, right? And we would tell, say, AT and T that a geosynchronous uh, communication satellite would uh, last for uh, seven years, right? Uh, we make, and and so they would pay us every year a certain amount of money for the use of the sat uh, for the satellite until we'd make money at we'd break even at five years, then and then we make money by year seven, and we hope to get to ten. Uh, and and get some more money, uh, but but then uh, then we came up with this idea about a shopping center model, you know, where we actually sold things. Uh, uh, um, we set, sold the transponders for telephone communications uh, to different uh, companies, like say, um, uh, you know, uh, to AT and T or uh, other companies, and we would keep a few of those for. Um, for spares, but but when we weren't using when when it wasn't being a spare, um, we could sell time on it. Um, and so what, what happened is is by get, getting people to pay, pony up money ahead of time, is that we didn't have to foot all the costs at the front end. Uh, is that we actually had customers that would pay us so that we we so that uh, we could get money a lot sooner. Um, so, uh, so actually looking at some of the business models that have existed uh, uh, for the space program would be actually been really good um, uh, in your presentation. Uh, and so I would suggest maybe something like that. Now, you know, I was, I just did command and control and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the science processing, that's all I really did. So, but but it was really fun to actually be around and 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 see all these kinds of things going on in the in the manu in the production and manufacturing and so. But anyway, so this is a fascinating field and uh, and uh, and because of the commercialization of space, uh, this is really becoming a big issue. Uh, timely, so, very timely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much again for thank you to the team, team members. You did great. Uh, it was very nice to meet uh, all of you virtually and uh, to meet some of the judges as well for me. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. I know we have Jennifer. I don't know if she has any, yep. any comments. Thank you very much. It was this has been a joy to work with this team and we really appreciate the opportunity to hear from, from all of you. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.